Welcome everyone to our episode 80 of season four. In today's podcast, in today's episode, we are going to talk about learning to decide with your intuitive mind. We are going to go deep into the intuition science and what is happening when we decide many things in our lives. How can we trust more what we feel and this kind of inherent uh, force that we have, these pathways that are becoming activated and how we can uh, start to measure more the um, decisions that we have in in terms of trusting more what we know, our memory and the past events of our lives. So we are going to first begin with the definition of intuition. Intuition has been defined as the instantaneous experience based impression of coherence elicited by cues in the environment. So many of the things that we are seeing through our minds, we are receiving some signals. And if we create some coherent uh, narrative from those signals, that's when we get a much better fine tuning uh, tool of intuition. In a context of discovery, intuitive decision making processes can be conceptualized as occurring within two stages. So the first one of which comprises an implicit perception of coherence that is not yet verbalizable. So that's like a hunch, that's like the um, sensation in your body that you know the answer, you know what you have to do, you know how to behave. Those are the things that you feel first. It is your heart speaking. It is a present moment. It is this perception that you cannot yet verbalize. Through a process of spreading the activation, this initially non-conscious non -conscious perception gradually crosses over a threshold of awareness and thereby becomes explicable. So as we start gathering more um, neural systems, signals priming our brain and also recruiting many of these neurotransmitters, that's when we are going to cross the threshold of being aware of what we are doing. And that's when we can explain what we are feeling. And that's when we start also to mix this intuition process with reason. Because of its experiential basis, intuition shares conceptual similarities with implicit memory processes. As you remember some episodes ago, we described the different memory systems. And that's why it's important to know these memory systems because we can uh, have these tools available for us whenever we want to have much better decisions in our lives. So based on these implicit memory processes, the study that uh, the researchers of the article that to uh, review this topic, I used the article of Sander in 2015, intuitive decision-making as a gradual process investigating semantic intuition based and priming based decisions with functional MRI. So in order to investigate these uh, researchers addressed two questions. One is the gradual nature of intuitive process reflected on a neural level. Do intuition based decisions differ neurally from priming-based decisions? So those are the questions that they tried to answer and they used some of um, test in order to analyze the response of um, people 
when in a context of recognizing words and the meaning of the words, of course. People have to make decisions every day, and we are constantly having to decide. Also, our brain spends a lot of energy in those decisions. Often, people have to make them quickly, and you don't have time to start um, probably if it's something that requires adding numbers or something like that. Many times you don't even have the time, but you can kind of guess, but it is using your past experience, your implicit memory to decide something that you need to know by almost by hunch. So without the information, without time, you might need to fully understand a situation or to foresee the possible consequences of the choices you are making. That's where this is extremely important because nowadays we are facing a lot of things that we have to decide in a faster manner. And also we have to prioritize what kind of decisions we want to take and take away the decisions that are not really giving us something meaningful or uh, like what to wear, for example, in terms of your clothes, that's a, a decision that shouldn't take you much time and you should try to organize your life in order to not waste energy in those kinds of decisions and start saving energy for the ones that you are going to face during your days. So decisions that require to foresee the possible consequences are going to be very important. This is where one does not go through all the possible alternatives and steps of reasoning beforehand. And those decisions are called intuitive because you are not um, analyzing too much the things. You are not um, taking many data or facts or things in order to make a decision. You need to trust more in this inherent information from your body, from your heart, and from these kind of hunches, because they are also based on this kind of implicit memory, and they are also based on past experiences. So trust more in this kind of intuition. And many times we have experienced this in exams, in tests, in, in an interview, in driving, you take a decision and you don't even think about it. But that was the best decision. When you left that answer, for example, in an exam, the first one that came to your mind, that's pretty much 90% the best answer. So that's how our intuition is extremely accurate. Decisions like this, where you have to trust in this intuitive system, the present functional magnetic resonant imaging study set was set out to contribute to, to the ongoing debate on the topic providing behavioral and neural results that may help to understand the concept better. So what do we need? What are the ingredients of this intuitive process? We are going to find out in the next um the next story that we are going to have. So in 1990, Bowers, another researcher, put forward the idea that intuitive decision-making is the immediate perception of coherence in the environment. So the idea of intuitive decision-making is the immediate, immediate right now, perception of coherence in the environment. What is the construct? What are you seeing? What are the signals? What are the patterns that you can recognize? All of those are going to start to add up so that you can have a much better um, coherent decision. According to these and to these researchers and authors, intuitive decision-making can be conceived of as a pre preliminary 
perception of coherence, pattern, and meaning and structure. So those are the things that you need to recognize. That is at first not consciously represented, but nevertheless guides thought and inquiry towards a hunch, a hypothesis about the nature of the coherence in question. So that's what we want to do, start recognizing these patterns, these signals, creating a structure of meaning and using this hunch and hypothesis, questions, inquiry, our curiosity to decide our lives in a much more readily fashion. These researchers conceptualize the intuitive decision-making process in a two-stage model. In the first stage, through a process of automatically spreading activation that is evoked by certain clues of coherence in the sensory input, the decision-maker has a tacit or implicit perception of coherence. So this is like when you are uh, waiting for the green light to go forward. So those are your cues, the red, the, the yellow, and your green light. The green light is giving you the cues that you need to move forward in your car. So those are some of the cues that you can recognize, some of the patterns that you can recognize in the world. And that's how we work many times. Well, this coherence and this implicit perception is not explic explicitly verbalized the source of this impression. So you can have already an image, you can have already an abstraction of the things that you are seeing. And in this first stage called guiding stage of intu intuition, clues to coherence activate relevant mnemonic and semantic networks in a graded and cumulative fashion. So what does this mean? You are gathering clues, you are creating by your memory, by certain, um, for example, keywords, these mnemonic techniques to remember something. And the semantic networks means the information that you have from the history of the experiences for, from someone else from something that you saw and from something that you try, you are trying, for example, to apply and you are creating your own unique model. So this is going to give rise to a preliminary intuitive feeling. That's why it's important to read more and to start gathering information, to know more about ourselves because we are creating a database that is going to be picked up very quickly in these moments where you need to create a decision without too much time and trust more in your intuition. The authors postulate that the tacit perception of coherence guide people gradually to an explicit representation of it in the form of a hunch or a hypothesis. So when you have enough data, when you have enough power to decide, that's when you create this coherence and then you can decide with more confidence. These researchers and authors elaborate that eventually the level of pattern activation is sufficient to cross the threshold of consciousness and at that point, it is represented as a hunch or the hypothesis. In this overcoming of the threshold of awareness, then what is coming is an integrative stage of intuition. So now you are going to use more uh, underlying reasoning, reasoning stage 
that is going to help you to integrate all the information that you already have by these mnemonic uh, techniques. And you are also going to use the patterns. You are also going to use what you have lived. So you are going to take a much better decision because you are creating this expanding network. Now, what happens with this gradual unfolding of your intuitive processing? Within this two stage proposed by Bowers in 1990, they propose that the cognitive process that underlie intuitive hunches are continuous rather than discontinuous in nature. So you keep receiving this information, these hunches, these feelings, and your body keeps telling you, trusting yourself, trusting yourself by a sweat in the hands, by some uh, butterflies in the stomach, by anything that you can perceive in your body. All of those are the signals of doing something or not doing something, trusting someone or not just trusting someone. So this is what can help us really, sometimes even, that this is life decisions. So according to this continuity model, intuition is conceived of as a gradual process of leading from the first immediate implicit perception of a complex and vague input to a more explicit experience characterized by being able to verbalize why and how certain pieces of semantic information might belong together. So let's say, for example, that someone calls you, you pick up the phone and you start talking and this person says that he is calling from a bank and it is your bank and he or she starts to describe all your information, which supposedly no one should have and starts telling you that there are some chargers in your credit card and while he's ex he's explaining all that information you are feeling something you are feeling that this call is not supposed to continue you are feeling that this person is trying to take advantage of you but probably you are a little bit distracted not trusting your intuition and you keep the call so he keeps telling you more and more data and you start doubting yourself. And that's the moment where you either trust your intuition and uh, turn off the call or reject the call or simply terminate the call or you continue and you might probably regret what you are going to do because this person most likely already convinced you that this information is real that's how we can distinguish by how we feel it is not so much a brain process yet it is more the process of the body it is more the process of the heart it is more the process of gathering this information and trusting yourself so what is it going to happen when you start taking these pieces and assembling the puzzle. The impression of coherence is building up implicitly over time. The more environmental cues, the more this person is talking, and probably you can even question something, and the more he makes a mistake or starts telling you uh, false information, that's when you have a hint of taking the direction of terminating the call and saving your money. In that way, accruing meaning, the more representations are activated in memory. And in these representations, you are listening to a person that in two weeks time or three weeks ago, uh, probably that person told you about an experience of these kind of calls. So you start recognizing this, and this is just the memory that becomes activated because you are gathering more and more cues. 
This model may be related to the idea that unconscious thought organizes information. These are things that are happening while you are trying to pay attention to the call. So these are unconscious things. These are unconscious thoughts, but they are giving you cues. They are giving you signals on what to do. For instance, and other researchers in 2014, Ritter and uh, Gis Trenius, recently proposed, based on their empirical findings, that representations become better organized and more polarized, and that memory becomes more gist based during an unconscious thought period. So this is the incubation period that you have this is the period that your body is giving you to trust your body, to trust your heart, to decide when, what you really want to do. The results, this, the results of these researchers may suggest that unconscious thought is a process wherein disorganized information becomes more and more organized until some kind of threshold is reached and conclusions can be transferred to consciousness. So as, as I explained in this um, hypothetic situation, you are gathering information while you keep talking with the person, you keep bringing information to your memory and you know and you feel that you should terminate the call. So trusting that is going to save you. To empirically test their two-stage conceptualization of intuition, Bowers in 1990 developed several experimental paradigms, one of which is the triad task, which is now widely used to investigate intuitive decision processes. In this task, participants are asked to assess the semantic coherence of words triads. Three words presented below each other that are either semantically linked through the existence of a fourth word that describes this link or are semantically unrelated, which has been called semantic coherent judgment. Participants are instructed not only to indicate whether they think the triad is semantically coherent, but also to make an attempt to find the solution. That is to explicitly name the common associate, which is going to be abbreviated as CA, common associate. What is the common thread? What is the common topic of these three words? Both this coherence judgment and the attempt to name the common associate require the activation of distantly related concepts in semantic memory. Therewith, it is possible to determine in which intuitive stage a person is. If the participant judges a word triad correctly as coherent, but cannot name a possible solution, this is an indicator of her being in the guiding stage of intuition. So when you cannot explain why you decide something or why you did uh, gave this turn or why you decide to a certain job or why you didn't trust a person, that's your intuition speaking. You don't have words for to explain the decision, but you know that was the best decision. If the participant, however, judges a triad correctly as coherent and is additional able to name a correct um, common associate, this indicator of her being in the integrative stage of intuition. If you already know what is the association, if you already know why did you decide for that, that's because you already have integrated all the information from your life, from past, past experiences, and from other people that told you uh, about those things. The typical empirical finding is that participants are remarkably correct in discriminating between coherent and incoherent triads. So our intuition is pretty good. 
and we should trust it more. Even in the guiding stage, that is, when they are not able to explicitly uh, name the common associate. So when you don't even know why you decided something or why you don't trust someone, you are doing the right thing. You are taking the right decision. Intuition and priming. What is happening with priming of your brain? What is happening with this process that is going to activate your brain? Our, the second research question of these researchers focuses on the underlying processes of the intuitive decision making in relation to implicit memory processes as follows. The definition of intuition that Bowers, Bowers in 1990 put forward as outlined above, as I explained it, seizes on one aspect, which is rapidity in intuitive judgment. Number two, the lack of an explicit basis for decisions made intuitively. When you cannot explain, that's another uh, parameter that they are going to analyze. Number three, the estimulative, stimulative nature of intuition to initiate and guide your decisions. This occurs or concurs, sorry, concurs with other definitions of intuition, such as quick and mostly not conscious process with regard to the underlying cognitive processes as well as the source of the decision, which is going to give uh, um, way to number three, based on tacit knowledge, which is practical knowledge, and four, results in some sort of feeling gravitating towards an idea or hunch that is strong enough to act upon. It is interesting that this apprehension intuition seems to coincide with what has been conceived as implicit memory process. So this implicit memory process is now giving us a lot of material to decide to have a much better intuition. As discussed in recent contribution of other, of other researchers, one could ask whether given the conceptualization of intuition as the ability to create an idea or solution, mostly on the basis of implicitly acquired knowledge, even if one cannot explain how one arrived at the decision or solution, the intuitive decision processes and implicit memory mechanisms are simply two sides of the same coin. So you are using your knowledge, you are using what you have heard, you are using your experiences, you are using a lot of things, but you don't have sometimes the correct learning of steps or uh, rationalized too much about things, but you know that you take the right decision. So this is the intuitive process and we have perform this more than we really know and more than we um, should really judge in terms of trusting it or not trusting. According to another researchers in 1992, Skakter, implicit memory has been defined as unintentional, non-conscious form of retention that can be contrasted with explicit memory, which involves conscious recollection of previous experiences. So this is when you witness something or listen to something, probably you were uh, on the line to ask for a coffee and some people were talking about the experience of these kind of calls where people want to take advantage of you in terms of um, cloning your credit card or something like that. And you are just listening in the background because you are just waiting, you are just doing something else probably in your cell phone, but you are paying attention also to unconsciously 
to this kind of conversation. So all of this memory is going to be pulled from your system when you have to decide and when it happens to you to remember that you heard that conversation. And then when you are living those experiences, you know and you trust and your body is telling you, you know the information, you know what to do, finish the call and leave this person to go. So these, the, the experiment that these people do consisted of two different experimental blocks. Lexical decision blocks, so this is the incorporation of a conceptual priming procedure. And number two, semantic coherence judgment of blocks, blocks of words. Usage of the triad task to assess intuitive performance. In the lexical decision blocks, which was eight in total, consisting of 20 trials, 20 attempts, participants were presented every two seconds with a word or a non-word and had to decide which of the two it was. So they had to choose coherent, incoherent, or not even related. In the semantic coherent judgment blocks, which was eight in total, eight blocks, and consisting of 15 trials, 15 attempts, each trial consisted of two parts, the coherence judgment and a subsequent word stem completion. First, the word triad was presented and all three words presented sim simultaneously, one beneath the other. And participants had to judge each semantic coherence within four seconds. So they just had four seconds to decide. They had three response options. First, the triad is incoherent, defined in the instructions as not having any word in common. The second choice, the triad is coherent and therefore has a four word in common, but there is not explanation that cannot be retrieved at this time. So you already know, that there is a, a fourth word or can be a fourth word. You cannot explain why. That's the, the other choice. And the third choice is the triad is coherent and a CA, so the CA is the, um, the reason, the common associate can be retrieved immediately. So you know why, no? This is because you are making your brain faster, you're making your, your brain more practical and you're making your brain really, really work in terms of recruiting all the elements of your memory, implicit memory, semantic memory, and all of these kind of processes that we discussed several episodes ago. So now we are going to see the, um, the examples that they use in the experiment. I am going to share the, the screen so that we can see what happened. So in the first exper experiment, this was um, the words that, that they use. These are the blocks that they use in the first experiment, in the setting A or in the block A, experimental design behavioral press study. It was, this is the experiment that Bauer did so this is the previous things that they used in order to design the second one that is that is here. So this experiment depicts a coherent triad followed by a non-word in the lexical decision task. So as you can see, this is the triad of words and you have, well, they have to decide if they make sense in terms of having a relation. Setting B or block B depicts a coherent triad and followed by a semantically unrelated word and the number C depicts a coherent triad also followed by the actual preordained solution. So this is the common associate. 
This is the solutions. What is this talking about? Salt deep foam ocean. Salt deep foam council. I don't know. I don't even know that word. It's a non word. So salt deep foam light doesn't have to do with the ocean and salt deep foam ocean. So those were the choices. Incoherent triads were only used as co controls and could be either followed by a non-word or by a word semantically unrelated to all its con constituents, as we can see here. This is a non-word, this is a word that is unrelated, and this is the correct example. So participants were not informed about the existence of the two different triad types, of course, this is the process of doing the research, not giving them what is the design. So coherent or incoherent. They were just instructed to read the three words and to perform the lexical decision task. So to ensure that participants indeed read the three words and in the beginning of each trial, they were told that we would represent them with some of the words after the experiments and that they had to discriminate then between old and new words. So of course, this kind of test starts complicating as you move forward, as you demonstrate that you have a very good intuition and you are really training your brain to respond quickly. So that's what we are seeing here. The more we repeat these kinds of experiments, the faster our brain is going to recruit all of the things, and we are going to know quickly that this is the correct answer. So now, in the experiment from these researchers, what happened? What do they do? Well, they did in the first block or the first trial, let's say, they divided into uh, tasks. Task, task one was the lexical decision. Remember that this is like the previous one. And the task two is the coherent judgment according to the semantic. So here they just had to recognize if this is a word or not, if this is uh, coherent or not. That's it, no? So in this second part, what they had to do is what we observe, but now they added a third um, a third um, experiment, let's say. In this third one, what they did is that they had the word stem completion. So what is the correct answer. So in, in this first um, set of experiments, letter A, this is the example of a coherent triad preceded by, in the lexical decision block, by either a non-word or a semantically unrelated word and followed in the word stem completion by the first two letters of the actual solution. So this was kind of the easiest. Example B or the experiments B is the example of an incoherent triad preceded in the lexical decision blocks by either a non-word or an unrelated word and followed in the word steam completion by the first two letters of a semantically unrelated word. So this is more complicated. Now here we have two words that they are not related. So followed in the word steam with a semantically unrelated word. So as you can see here, the remote associate would be salt, okay? Number C, example of a prime triad preceded in the lexical decision blocks by the prime consisting of the synonym of one word 
of the three triads constituents and following the word steam completion by the first two letters of this prime synonym. So as you can see here, it is the repetition of the word steam completion. And here there is something that doesn't match with this um, incoherent or well unrelated word, let's say. So the experiment experimental design of this fMRI study, the participants work on alternating blocks of lexical decision and the triad task. In this triad task, they consisted of this semantic coherence judgment and word steam completion. In the coherence judgment task, participants had three response options. Incoherent, the triad is perceived as incoherent. This is the response option one, the triad is incoherent. Coherent, so this is the triad is perceived as coherent, but a possible um, common associate cannot be named immediately. That is the response option two. The triad is coherent and therefore has a four word in common, but a CA cannot be retrieved at this time. So this is when you already know what you chose, but you cannot explain why you have a solution. And the um, option three, response option three, the triad is coherent and a CA can be retrieved immediately to test whether participants could name the correct CA when they had judged the trial as coherent and at the same time indicate that they knew the CA, they were presented with all coherent and prime triads again, right after the scanning procedure and had to write them down in a paper and pencil questionnaire. So now they are giving more clues about these kind of processes. And as you can see, this is just how amazing our brains can start to work. If we really start making more progress in terms of how we allow our brains to work for, uh, for us and recruiting the information and doing the things that we are supposed to do quickly in our lives. So that's what we were, we are supposed to do many times. We have to start enhancing our responses and creating more uh, coherence, creating more impressions, creating more patterns, creating more intuitive processes because we are going to face a world where we are going to be presented with a lot of information that it, it is not um, coherent, it is not congruent, and we should trust more in ourselves. We should trust, trust more in this mapping system that we can create where when we practice what we want to do in our lives, what we want to decide, and what we uh, want to start also learning more about. So I hope that this information really awakens your mind to all of the processes that we really, really should start uh, taking more advantage of and how these kind of uh, experiments and how this kind of science is based on these repetition processes that we can always design in our lives. So the conclusions of this study were in order to answer the question one, the data support and continuity model of intuition because the two intuitive stages of how quantitatively distinct brain activation patterns are happening. And regarding to the question two, they can draw pre preliminary conclusions of a qualitative di difference between intuition-based and priming-based decision. And this priming-based decision is extremely important. This is just the final comment that I'm going to, to say. 
priming means you are being presented with some information. For example, what we just lived during the pandemic. You were presented with news, very toxic news, very alarming news, very um, news that were, were going to prime your fear. And then, of course, what follows? Follows the solution. What is the solution for the pandemic? You know where I'm going. Sometimes, still, you cannot say the words, but you know that the solution was going to be a medication. So this kind of medication was going to save you from the threat, but you were already primed at least one year. So, and they were trying to prime your mind so that your decision was unequivocally what they wanted. That's the way the world is working now. That's the way your mind is being primed all the time to take decisions that suddenly you realize that we're not the best ones. So thank you very much for paying attention. If you have any questions, if you want me to touch another topic, just leave some comments, give me a review, give me a uh, sus subscribe to the channel so that you get notified. And of course, start doing more for your brain instead of just relying on the information that you are being primed with. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and we will listen to each other on our next episode. Bye.